Oh, I haven't tried it. Ooh, what? It's very loud. I have to whisper almost. If it's too loud, then it... No, no, it's, we can leave it. So it's like, at the back, they say very good. So as long as nobody complains, then maybe we leave it like this. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. One thing. Thank you very much for having made the effort to come up here, and especially I would say thank you very much for having an interest in generating a good heart, which is quite, you know, it's not so obvious these days. Also, it's not so easy to generate a good heart or to have a good heart these days because so many difficult things happen. So this is what this course will be about. It will be um, not an easy endeavor, because as they say, quite a few of you are quite a few of you are totally new to Buddhism, but still we will give you the whole path. Right. We'll try to give you the whole path, and then you'll discuss on it. And meditations, who is leading the meditations? Huh? Kitty. Also the ones in the afternoon. Huh? Yeah. On purpose? <laughs> anyway, we'll see. So, um, yeah, so what we will try to do is like so that you kind of get some structure, that you start at least to understand the structure, how this is, you know, how this is a kind of step-by-step -step, um, path that is, that is being laid out or that's being done. And even amongst the Buddhists, there's many, there's quite a few different paths. So it's not that one is right and the other one is wrong. It's just that they are different, and they all lead to a state which is free from all suffering. Sounds attractive, or not so much? You know, sometimes people say, yeah, but what do you, I need my suffering, because otherwise, uh, how can I learn, or how can I have compassion, and all these kinds of things. So it's like, it is a state that would lead you out of suffering, but not so much the suffering, especially what one talks about, and one concentrates on, is the causes for the suffering, which is uh, negative emotions, defilements, veils on the on the mind, having kind of you know being very self-centered, also not caring about the happiness of others, uh, being very narrow, maybe caring about the happiness of those ones that are close to us or those that we identify with, but not really caring about the happiness of people that we don't care about, and especially not. Being in not being concerned with the happiness of beings that have have damaged us or have done us harm or maybe yeah, that we just you know maybe very instinctively don't like because they kind of rub us up the wrong way. If I say something in English and you don't understand, then just please ask. The kind of the, the course is not so big, so then that's okay that we can do. Uh, otherwise, for questions, because I don't hear so well, I hear less and less and less. Sign of old age, what to do. I'm not doing it on purpose, it's just happening. Uh, also, memory is like, you know, really going quickly. Um, so, I would be very grateful if you could write them down, your questions. Because also then, because then the person who is doing the recording, they don't have to tell me all the time, can you please repeat the question? Because then I have to read it out. So then I don't need to repeat it. And also you don't have to repeat it like if you're sitting at the back three or four times until I finally get what you want to ask. If English is a bit of a problem, it's okay. Um, write it in Hebrew and then I give it to Giddy and he quickly says it and transla uh, translates it for me. So that will be fine. Okay? So please don't feel shy that if there's anything you don't understand because of language, not so much because of topic, because there's many things that you will probably not be able to kind of put it together yet. You know, you, you're being given like pieces of puzzle, and there's many, many pieces to this puzzle, and maybe you haven't even seen the whole picture yet. So then, good just to keep these pieces and uh, try not to make too much to kind of try not to fit it into your views that you already have. Because then otherwise we start to kind of water it down a bit and it's not exactly what it means. You see what I mean? 
You will do it anyway, because that's what everybody does. I mean, it's very natural, but try not to, or try to see when you're doing this. You have that, you, also when you feel resistance, which will also happen, it's also fine, because maybe it's uh, views that conflict with what you believe, maybe it's things that you kind of deep down, we do believe it, but we don't want to believe it, <laughs> you know? And uh, some other things, you, there's really nothing that, you, that would be of any benefit to you if you would adapt that view. Then leave it, it's fine. You see, it's the Buddhist view, and nobody is expecting you to believe it. But, but if you are interested and if you want to try it out, then you, you, know, you need, to, need to try it out. Just throwing it out and saying it's no good for me, don't be too quick with that also. Otherwise, this whole effort of coming here and listening to me is for nothing. So, so like this. Also, please don't have the expectations that after this uh, five days or four, basically, You'll be walking out of here and knowing what Buddhism is all about. It's like not, yeah. But you will know from you. You will know the steps. This is what you will know. But then to fill out what goes in there, you will have to listen to teachings again and again and again and again. And every time you think you understand something, but then maybe you practice it and then you hear it again and then all of a sudden you you understand it in a deeper or in a different way. It's meant to be like this. I mean, this is a, this is a very natural progress. Because also, Buddhism is not kind of clear cut. There's no, not many things that are black and white. You know, you can say, this situation, then this, I do this. So this, because it depends on so many factors uh, and so many conditions that um, because nothing actually that we can perceive exists from its own side or is absolutely true, nothing. Everything exists, but it's like relatively true. Yeah, it's not absolutely true. This is the thing. This is why everything I'm saying, you can say, yes, but. So when you hear yourself also in a, you know, like inside saying, yes, but, if you can, try to check. Is that yes, but helpful or is it just to raise an argument? Because yes, but we can use in any case, but very often the yes, buts actually they they prevent us from doing what we actually want to do because just the lazy mind goes like yes, but da, 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 this and that. And so sometimes it's good to question our own yes, buts and then you know challenge it and look at it and go so, and then try to bring up a good argument why you came up with this yes, but. Like, for example, Buddhism says uh, that the mind is totally pure by nature. Um, and then one can say, yes, but, but why is the world in such a bad state, for example? So, so then again, one tries to almost contradict this view. It's the Buddhist view that the mind, which is not the brain, um, is kind of pure by nature, but this purity is covered. Like the mind has basic goodness, spaciousness, intelligence. Intelligence which you can never lose. So that is the Buddhist view. So today in the car we had this kind of conversation that Shoshana said, because I said, this is the problem with Westerners, that we don't trust it. You know, we kind of go around with our low self-esteem and the big ego and I'm the worst of all and all this. We never kind of, we don't take this resource when we need it, when, when we're in a bad state. We're not going there. Then we get stuck in our defilements, uh, negative emotions, feeling bad about ourselves, feeling bad about the world, and it's all their fault, and it's also my fault, and all this. We hardly ever go there. So for me, this is a, is a, is a sign that we don't trust it. We don't really believe it. Okay, maybe here, and it's a nice idea, isn't it? It's a very nice idea that everybody is pure by nature. Or what do you think? Okay, see how many people know? I also say it. What? I, I agree. What? It's you also know it. Yeah, okay. So it's a nice idea, but do we do we really trust it the same way as Asian people trust it or you know Buddhists trust it who grow up with that kind of view? In Christianity we grow up with the view that uh, you know you're sinful from the beginning, you're already born in sin. And it's only through the grace of God that, that you know that we, you can get somewhere. 
where you maybe want to go. So it's a totally different view. And also it's like, here you don't have to develop anything. It's already there. You don't have to kind of download anything. It's already there. All you have to do is delete, like our own views, our negative emotions and all this. So deleting is very, very easy. But like with the mind, because of very, very deep-seated um, habitual tendencies, it's much more difficult. So the more you trust that Buddha nature, uh, maybe I should call it Buddha nature, the more you trust that, because otherwise you think it's only Buddhists have it, everybody has it, even little ants on the ground. Whoever has a mind, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about the mind tonight, whoever has a mind has that, that the nature of that mind is pure. So this is a challenging view. So for you, it's kind of, it's really good to, to go into that and to think, what would happen to my view of the world if I would start to believe that everybody has this Buddha nature? Even people who are rapists and murderers and terrorists and, and uh, you know, crooks and uh, CEOs that cheat and don't pay their taxes or whatever, even people in government, even those, the, the, the nature of their mind is pure. So it's good to, for you to kind of, if I would take that on board, what would happen to my, to my own well-being or not well-being or whatever, yeah? Because we're very quick by saying, well, some people by nature, they're bad. There's nothing we can do about this, isn't it? This is a view that is very, it's quite strong, actually. And then we don't even look for it. We don't even give them a chance. Yeah. So I like it. But the main thing is that we ourselves, we start to believe in that pure nature mind. That is what is important. Whether others have it or not, then we don't know. I mean, we don't know. In Buddhism, it is said that everybody has it. Yeah. And then already the problem starts because we don't see it. So Buddhism in general is not a system of devotion, or even though it looks like it, uh, devotion or admiration or faith. Buddhism is a system of exploring, analyzing, and then knowing. Knowing what? Knowing what brings happiness and knowing what brings suffering. So even if we know all the 84,000 teachings of the Buddha, so don't worry, we're not going through them in these five days, all of them. So even though we would know them all by heart, which, uh, I mean, there are monks and also nuns who do a lot of, mem you know, they memorize the whole thing. So they know incredibly amount of texts by heart. It's like, wow. They can quote, like, and I'm sure also the people, that, uh, you know, uh, in Judaism, some people who really study the text, they can quote down that page, it says this, 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 this. Yeah, so even if you know all this by heart, it's still inside not much transforms. Because you only heard about it, or you only know it intellectually, so you have to... So what one does is like one listens to the teachings, one looks if it makes sense, and then one thinks, reflects on it again and again and again and again and again. So then finally, layer by layer, these habitual tendencies get um, removed. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is what it is. But, and uh, I think, I don't know if you talked about frustrations. I said that we do it. Huh? I just said that we do it. Okay, because here it says frustration to the 35 foot is ah. optional. Okay. Optional, you don't have to come. So even though it looks like it, like prostrating to the to something that has you know pictures and statues and cookies and fruits and whatever, <laughs> is um, it it might look like devotion, but you're not doing it for the sake of the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't really mind if you don't prostrate. So don't worry, you don't have to prostrate if you don't want to. Um, but if you're not prostrating again, look at your. You know, what does it do to you when you see other Israelis? I'm not Jewish and I'm not Israeli, so I'm fine. You don't have to worry about me. I never heard that one should not prostrate. Um, 
So, but what does it do to you when you see other Jewish Israelis kind of prostrating? What you, so then again, you just go, well, it's none of my business what they do. If I don't, she said, if I don't want to prostrate, then I don't have to. If you want to learn how to prostrate, we're very happy to show you. And what we will be doing in the morning is a um, purification practice to help us speed up that process of kind of getting rid of all these defilements. Um, which is called prostration to the 35 Buddhas. Are you are you going to do it or wait? I mean, it says here. So yeah. So so you don't have to come if you don't want to come. It's fine. So you you only come for 6:30 for the meditation. Um, but for those who want to come and have never done it, um, maybe I'll give you an explanation tomorrow in the break, in the first break. Okay. Yeah. Um, tomorrow morning, if you want to come six o'clock, you can come. You can look how it looks for those who know how to do it. It's it's like it's like um, Buddhist yoga, basically. Yeah, it's it's a lot of uh, movement also. Uh, what one imagines or one visualizes, because we do we will learn that we do actions with the body, with the speech, and with the mind. Yeah, even though they are mind, what? Yeah, thoughts. Thoughts then lead to action. So we have these three doors, as it is called. So by prostrating. Um, to not so much to the Buddha as a person, but more by, to, by prostrating to total universal compassion and wisdom. And I'm not saying that the Buddha is the only one who has that. I don't know. Jesus maybe has it also. I don't know. I, I haven't studied it. Or, you know, in Hinduism, these gods. I don't know. I haven't studied it. But for me, personally, it's the Buddha. It's like something like totally completed or developed compassion and wisdom. My own purity of the mind, I want to attain that same goal. So it's not just going close to, a, to an awakened being, is the goal is to be fully awakened, just like the Buddha, because that's what it means. The word Buddha means awakened. So by prostrating to something like that, to, to a result that we want to attain, that enhances our respect and maybe our determination also to follow that path, and by doing it physically with the body, one purifies negativities or negative actions that we have done with the body. By reciting the names of these 35 Buddhas, because not only Shakyamuni Buddhas, there are many Buddhas. Um, by reciting these names, one purifies actions, negative actions of the speech. And by um, visualizing that each time a Buddha is coming into you, uh, then one purifies negative actions of the mind. Now again, that sounds very easy, but if you do this for the first time and you think you can do this, like, you know, reciting the names, visualizing, thinking what you're purifying, no, of course not. You will be concentrating on your body action and that's it, yeah? But if you have any aversion to that or if you feel that mm -mm -mm, this, it doesn't seem right to me, then by all means, don't do it. Also, starting from tomorrow, whenever I come in in the morning and the first session in the afternoon, I will do prostrations. I'm used to do that. Also, I'm almost 70, so at least, and I'm lazy, so at least I do some exercise. So, so it's kind of okay. So then, for those who are really interested, um, I will explain it um, quickly at 10.30 tomorrow. Um, can I have a pen? Because then I will float it in, otherwise I forget. Okay? For those who don't know, and for those who know and want to have more explanation, then just come. Because if you don't want to do it anyway, because if you don't want to do it anyway, then um, there's no need to know. Okay? <laughs> well, I, I, I bring one tomorrow. I have some in my room. Okay, so the whole thing is about transforming the mind, or even just you know purifying or cleansing the mind. Yeah. So as I said, this goes it goes in three steps. One hears the teachings, and you will need instructions. You know, it's not that each of us is born with this wish to be free from suffering, isn't it? Not sure. Would you like to be free from suffering? Yes. Okay. Would you like to be, you know, always in contact with love, compassion, wisdom? 
stable, whatever the situation is. It's not about changing the world, okay? It's about changing how we react to the world. So we react without, especially without um, defilements, without anger, without fear. Like fear, uh, panicky fear, unreasonable fear, this kind of thing. Uh, sometimes fear can be quite helpful. Uh, but like totally open, like with a lot of space, like also seeing the point of the other. Because like very often when we have conversations, we always, we judge other people from our point of view. We, we don't know how they feel. Like the other day I had a conversation with somebody said, wow, the Tibetans are so cruel. They give away their children to the monastery and it's horrible. And, you know, because there was this movie, Gilgul or whatever, and there was like three seconds of crying in the whole movie. Otherwise the boy was quite happy, but wow, these three seconds when they separated, that became like so important. So I said, well, you know, for these parents, it's it's a great honor, and um, they still have contact with the boy, and yeah, it's, it's not easy at the first moment, but then we had a very good mother and father in Tenzin Zopa. This monk was looking after him, was still looking after him. Now he's, I don't know, 15, 15, I think he's now. Punsok Rinpoche. So he's become very, very beautiful being, and he speaks already very good English, and. Uh, so, and Tenzin Zopo is, has become his teacher, and his mother, and his father, and everything. is a very, very loving relationship between the two. Uh, when Tenzin Zopo was in Switzerland, he was going first to Malaysia, and then back to Sera. So he knows that uh, the little Rinpoche, he really likes blueberries. So that's all he took in his suitcase, nothing for himself, but blueberries. And we had to pack them so they wouldn't go moldy or, you know, squashed or whatever. So, I was just thinking about him, what he could bring him, and there's so much joy in finding these boxes of blueberries <laughs> that he was, oh, wow, it was so nice to see. Also, and you can see the very good relationship that they have um, with each other. So anyway, so, you know, we, we very often judge what we think, we know what other people think, or why they do that, and whether they that. So it's, again, it's not about that. It's about um, knowing our own mind. So for that, um, as I said, we listen to the teachings, we think about them, we meditate on them, and also the, the teachings on mind, because this is a long rim retreat, which said it means like the graduated path to enlightenment. So the teachings about the mind are not in there, but if you look at your little booklet that you have, that you got, I did put them in because, like, the, usually the monks, when they, this one, the, the clear one, because the monks um, in the monasteries, they learn this when they're like eight years old or something, what the mind is, how the mind works, and all this. So, again, I also know that here in the West we have psychology and we have psychoanalysis and these kind of things, and they also have explanations about how the mind works and what the mind is, it might be, again, it might be conflicting. So just one thing to remember is the mind is not the brain in Buddhism. Okay? When they talk about mind, it means it is something that is, the definition of it is clear and knowing, but is not matter but has the ability to know its object and to engage with that object, to do something with this object. So look at the list that I gave you here because it's kind of divided into, um, into different minds here. So also I made this little booklet so you don't have to write. And you can, there's something you can take home. You can write into the booklet if you want. You can make notes and, yeah? and then you can take it home and maybe from time to time take it out again, and then after 10 years of following Buddhist teachings, you come across your first notes, and you go like, oh my, is that what she said, or is that how I understood it? No, maybe not like this. Okay. Actually, when I looked at my first notes that I took in the Kopan course, and I had them in Switzerland stored away somewhere, and I was living in India, maybe after 15 years I took them out again. And I thought, wow, this course was so precise and it was so complete, but I didn't understand the thing. But I did make notes, and then in the afternoon or in the break, I would write them a little bit nicer and I make a nice, nice notebook. And I kept it for some reason. And it was like, 
Yeah. Yeah. All the lists were there. Yeah. So by the way, also this in Buddhism there's a lot of lists. So like Christians, they believe in God, and Buddhists, they believe in lists. <laughs> okay? so, uh, so makes sometimes it makes it easier. So when I said mind is a, is some kind of well you could call it energy, but it's energy is also matter. So it's not matter, but it has as I said it has the ability to perceive objects, to perceive its object, and for this we need six different consciousnesses. So whatever is mind is consciousness, and whatever is consciousness is mind. Yeah, sometimes one uses that word, and sometimes one uses mind, and sometimes there is consciousness. Usually when, when one talks about the six main minds, one says consciousness, because it makes it a bit more easy. And it is what the, what the word says, it's conscious, it knows, right? It knows its object. So you have I consciousness, who knows shape and color, not cup. I consciousness does not know cup. It knows shape and color. You have ear consciousness who knows sounds, articulate, non-articulate, high, low, 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 the whole range, okay? Nose consciousness knows what? Smells, of course. Tongue consciousness knows taste. So this, I think, we learned, this we learned at school, I think, at one point, that the tongue doesn't recognize pizza, but the tongue recognizes salty, sour, sweet, astringent, and bitter. These are the five things that the tongue recognizes, and that's it. Then the pizza is in the head. The pizza is a construct in the mind that labels it that pizza, yeah? So tongue consciousness knows tastes, body consciousness knows soft, hard, smooth, rough, cold, hot. Funny enough, also hunger and thirst, I think, to put into body consciousness. And then is the mental consciousness. So we have the five sense consciousnesses. They are, they need something in order to be able to function. So they need an organ. Uh, they need an eye that works, they need an ear that works, a nose that works, a tongue that works, and uh, and a body kind of tactile sensation that works. And they need an object. So uh, they need some visual object, or they need a sound, or a uh, smell, a taste, or a something that you touch. Yeah. Okay. The mental consciousness is what one pays the most attention to. But this one doesn't perceive directly. It perceives or it, it kind of functions for us unrealized beings through concepts. And because a concept or a thought is permanent as it's not changing and it's always kind of flavored with what we already knew before, whether we liked it or not and all this. So this is, it is quite distorted, okay? So mental consciousness, we don't really have access yet directly to this only through concepts, yeah? Okay? So then the mind has two qualities, the clarity, it is formless and it allows for objects to rise in it, awareness, it can engage with the objects. Now if you want to know about mind and function, then uh, Geshima is coming and the whole weekend is on it. It's really worthwhile. If you want to engage in practicing Buddhism, I, knowing the mind, because we won't have that much time to go into it, I just go through the lists. And also these kind of direct, the, the, the six consciousness is not so much to say about. What we concentrate on afterwards is the mental factors. Because there's these main minds who just recognize their objects. But then these main minds are colored or flavored by what is called mental factors. Some of them are always there, some of them are determining, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, meaning leading to happiness or leading to suffering. Then, of course, the negative ones leading to suffering, the positive ones leading to happiness. And I think, so there's 51, but quite honestly, I think that the, the list can be extended also. It's just that the Buddha Inca, they came up with these 51 uh, mental factors. 
So for every moment of perception, so kind of these mental factors, they are like helpers for this mind to perceive. Yeah. For the, for the